Good afternoon and welcome to the debate here. I'm sitting here wondering what has happened to uh, gender equality in panels, but um, um, we're not here all, so there will be a little bit more panels later on. But uh, as usual, men are in a minority. This was, by the way, not the subject for today. Uh, the subject was uh, TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, where I think the debate we've had so far has mostly concerned, or the most voices we've heard has been either from government or from big business. But what about the uh, small business sector, which is, of course, something like 90% of all the companies, or maybe even more? What are the challenges for them? So it's nice for me to uh, welcome you all on behalf of EPC and the uh, United States Mission to the European Union. We're doing this uh, in partnership and doing it together. And I hope we can have a good debate about the issues uh, for the next couple of hours. As you know, uh, TTIP, it says trade and investment, but it's not so much about liberalizing trade and investment because we have quite a liberal regime there already. It's much more actually about regulatory affairs. And I always hear from SMEs that standards and different uh, uh, regulations are more difficult for small businesses, so maybe this will be a good solution for them. But it can also be demanding. And obviously, when the whole sort of business environment changes, there will be winners and losers uh, in the new context. So what should the strategies be here? Should it, for example, be a question of uh, finding partners across the Atlantic? Is that something we should work on? Um, should we try to go it alone? And what is the situation then for the, for the SMEs? We should also, of course, remember that there will be obstacles on the way to the final result because the regulatory approaches are quite different in the EU and in the, in the US. I don't think I insult anybody by saying that Americans uh, normally have a rather commercial approach to things where Europeans tend to rely a bit more on precautionary principles. We will see how this all plays out. We will actually uh, be discussing both of, of the things because we have a we have a, a, two sessions uh, within the two hours we have here today. The first one, we will hear the voices of uh, the small businesses themselves. And the second one, we'll look more into these issues with the regulators. So let me now just introduce very briefly the, the, the panel or those uh, that are here already. For the first part of it, uh, particularly welcome to you, Kimberly Benson in American, Kim Benson, traveled all the way from California to, uh, to come here today. Um, she has a small business, or runs a small business on export management and, and business consultancy in San Diego in California, very south California, I think. Um, and uh, you've also, besides helping uh, U.S. manufacturers establish joint ventures and work in particular, I suppose, within the, uh, uh, the North American free trade area, but, but mostly towards uh, the, um, the American continent on the south. But you've also been involved in a number of issues in Washington, D.C. with governments. Uh, you've been um, serving on the Industry Trade Advisory Committee for Small and Minority Business in, in, in the U.S. and a number of other things. Um, so you're well qualified as a businesswoman, but also somebody who has been involved a bit with the, with the government side. So we look very much forward to hear what you have to say. And there will be a response from the European small businesses, Sabina Erskens from the organization called UAPME, which is the uh, European Organization for, for the Interest of Crafts and SMEs. Uh, Sabina is an uh, international trade and internationalization of SMEs advisor to UAPME, uh, so well placed to give us um, a response to that. Later on, we will welcome Denis Redonnet, who is the head of trade uh, strategy unit in the DG for trade in the European Commission, so the negotiator on, on the European side on SMEs. The problem is I don't know exactly when he comes, but he should be here just around uh, 5 o'clock. But in any case, we have with us already Christina Sevilla, who is Deputy Assistant U.S. Trade Representative for Small Business, so the American negotiator for small business. Um, Christina has a long career in, uh, in, in government and in trade, and has worked a lot also with your experiences on the free trade area between the Americas, the, uh, the North American free trade area. So I think we can have a good debate, and without further ado from my side, uh, let me invite you, Kim, after all your travel, I hope you're not too, <laughs> too jet-lagged, um, to, to give us your view Thank you very much. advice. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, 
My name is Kim Benson. I am the co-owner of Cange International. We're headquartered in San Diego, California. We're a small business, and we actually, um, as an export management company, we actually serve as an export department for our clients. So we work on a commission basis with US manufacturers and basically do everything that an export department would do for them. So identifying what countries they should be in, um, then finding the right distributors or the right distribution structure for them in the specific countries, and then managing those relationships on their behalf. Most of our experience has been with high-end uh, consumer goods for the home, such as kitchen appliances, which are both, as you uh, may know, a lot of them are either gas or electric, and so we've had lots of experience meeting standards around the world, not just in Europe, but in, in other regions as well. So I can speak a, a bit to the regulatory issues that, that surround some of these products that we deal with. 100% of our, of our revenue comes from export sales. So from my perspective as a small business, I'm constantly um, uh, you know, doing my best for, for my clients to make sure that they are well positioned in each of the markets and also well positioned as quickly as they can be as well, because I recognize that as a um, competitive advantage, it's important for them to get into the markets as fast as they can. When the topic of TTIP comes up in conversations, I'm often asked this question, you know, what does it, why does it matter um, that you're an SME versus a large corporation? And you know, what do SMEs need, or small and medium-sized businesses as the acronym, what, what do they need that's different from what large corporations need from an agreement like this? Um, before I answer those questions from my perspective, I'd like to make a couple of quick um, comments just to put everything in context. A recent study uh, showed that SMEs who export outperform their non-exporting counterparts in several different ways. They, they experience higher revenue growth, Higher, rev higher total revenues, and also higher uh, labor productivity. And in that same study, which was done by the US International Trade Commission, it was found that about 85% of the foreign sales that are made by multinational corporations are actually transactions to their own foreign affiliates, okay? So it's, it's, it's not exactly the same uh, when you compare that with the transactions that initiate from small and medium-sized businesses. In those cases, about 75% of those transactions are what you would consider a regular export transaction, you know, a, a sale from one company, you know, with a marked up price to a customer in another country. So in other words, SMEs are really the companies that are, that are even more directly impacted by things like tariffs and non-tariff barriers. Even, even in a different way, they're, they're impacted even in a different and more, in my opinion, more significant way than the multinationals who are, who are basically selling to themselves. Now, I don't mean to simplify it because obviously, you know, a lot of the multinational corporations are buying and selling across borders, even the components for their products and that kind of thing. So they have different, different issues. But the point is, when you look at even just the, the impact of a tariff, if I'm, if I'm having to calculate a tariff on a marked up price versus a multinational that's just basically shipping to, to themselves, there's, there's a different kind of an impact there and I would submit to you it's a more significant one. So what about the second question, what if anything do SME exporters need that's any different from what large corporations need and here's how I answer that question. If you're a large corporation, usually you will have on your staff a combination, a, a team of professionals involved in export compliance, involved in government relations, involved in export management. And those people collectively have a lot of different duties that they have to fulfill. Those can include developing strategies for either sourcing components or finding vendors or finding the right distributors in the country, overseeing export compliance programs, 
ensuring that the company is informed of changes when it comes to documentation, regulatory requirements, duty rates, and the list just keeps going on and on and on. There are, are a multitude of tasks that, that you need to do if you're a company that's trying to export your product. A, multiple, a multitude of things that you have to consider on a daily basis. And these are things that can change without you even having the ability to know with any reasonable amount of time that something's about to change. So keeping that in mind, in contrast, a small and medium-sized business is almost always working without a staff like that. So in order for them to export at all, let alone export in a competitive way or in a profitable way, you know, they require the same information. They require exactly the same information, the same quality of, of, of information, the same type of information as the large corporations do. And then they have to meet those same standards and, and whatever regulatory requirements are, are needed for a specific country. So basically, they're working without these staffs. So, it's, so again, these regulations that um, may or may not be duplicative or may or may not be necessary are, are impediments to the SME's ability to take their product international. So to the extent that those things can be minimized or eliminated or streamlined, which is the key here with TTIP, streamlining of, of regulations, not necessarily <coughs> eliminating them, because that's not the goal here, but rather streamlining them so that they're more congruous between the two regions. That's the key. Now, some primary goals of the TTIP include enhancing competitiveness, right, and also facilitating collaboration. And SMEs play a key role in each of these arenas. Competitiveness relates to innovation, getting your product to market as fast as you can, faster than your competition, with the best technological advances, at the right price, with the right distribution structure. But if we don't create an environment in which speed to market is optimized, what happens to those innovators and those inventors in the EU and the US? Consumers are demanding the most technologically advanced products. So in order for us to increase our competitiveness, we've really got to reduce that amount of time that it takes for the SMEs to obtain the information that they need, to make the export decisions, to then Meet those, meet those requirements and get the products into the markets. So again, to the extent that these standards can be streamlined, this is going to make a big difference for small and medium-sized businesses. Now I see a lot of opportunities for small businesses in both regions. Um, speaking from a US perspective now here for a minute, um, I see a lot of challenges for US small companies because what I'm seeing is they are, um, they are putting some self-imposed challenges on themselves. They are drawing the wrong conclusions about Europe. A lot of them, because they feel pressure to export more and more and more, with the economic downturn, they're also um, in a situation where they're trying to simplify things as much as possible, right? So they're trying to reduce their costs, and they're trying to minimize their financial risks. And the decisions that they're making with regard to Europe are, in my opinion, not really the right ones. They're, for example, a lot of them are appointing fewer distributors and distributors that are larger in scope, larger in size. But I believe, and what has happened with our company, we've, is we've taken the opposite strategy of appointing smaller distributors and more distributors so that we have more, much more of an effective presence in Europe. And so I think that's an important key for how we can collaborate moving forward. What I recommend for US companies, especially the small ones, is that they collaborate with one another. And I don't just mean talk to each other. I mean actually enter the market together. So instead of, you know, if you have a small business with one product, why not think in terms of bringing, you know, working together with some complementary product lines and then approaching the market together as a team, basically. Presenting your uh, solutions to the consumer as a whole 
and approaching smaller distributors and more distributors in Europe so that you get more of a presence. And you're also providing the distributor a more profitable, um, better situation for their business on the other side as well. So those are the kinds of opportunities that I see for, for how we can collaborate more, how small businesses can collaborate with one another and really um, minimize their financial risk by diversifying and also reduce their costs by going in and entering markets together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. Wonderful. A um, number of points that I think we, we might be able to pick up and maybe you could address as well. You said from the beginning that SMEs that export are more productive. They, they, they are they're doing better. I don't know what the causality is here. It could be that they export because they're good. We don't know. But right. the question I have is that I, I often hear European SMEs be more protective, if you like, uh, like to hide behind barriers rather than going into the open. But uh, do you share the view, if I may ask you, Sabine, that um, that is good to export? It makes you more competitive because you, you have to, to fight your way through, as you were saying, the, the maze. The other thing you said about the SMEs, do they actually have the resources to act internationally or outside of Europe, outside of the US? And at the same time, you mentioned that uh, a number of the barriers are being reduced, but there will still be some that requires expertise. And I'm sure, Kim, you would say, well, hire a consultant to do that for you. But can I ask you directly, just, just a very short answer. On balance, do you think the TTIP will create more opportunities than challenges? Will it be easier for, for the general SME, if they understand to change, to cope with it because of reduction in, in, in barriers? Yes, I, I, the, the short answer is yes, but I can give you a specific example. Um, several years ago, uh, this, was, this is going to be an example with actually Mexico, but it, the same would hold true in this situation with Europe. <clears throat> Our company at the time was representing a, a kitchen appliance company, and that product was faced with 20 or 25 percent duties. When the free trade agreement, and again, you know, I'm not talking about NAFTA in particular, I'm talking about free trade agreements in general and the effect, the positive effect that they can have. When, when the trade agreement went through, the duties were uh, reduced to zero. Prior to the trade agreement going into effect, we had a situation where we had a, a very highly priced product we could only really afford uh, one-step distribution in Mexico. In other words, our products would have been absolutely you know, astronomical in price if we had you know, one distributor in Mexico selling to retailers, selling to consumers. There were just too many steps in the chain, and there's no way that the product would have sold at all. So all we could have afforded, all we could afford and did afford at the time was one distributor selling through his own showroom to... Mexico, which was not at all a viable distribution structure for the type of product that we had. When the trade agreement went through and the duties went to zero, what that did was that bought us a viable distribution structure that we could not have had any other way. So when that occurred, we went from having one distribution out, one, one distributor and one retail outlet to having one distributor with 90 retail outlets throughout Mexico. So it was a huge game changer for us and it created millions of dollars worth of exports. Um, so my point there is when, when we look at duty rates being reduced, these, this is no small thing for, for a small company, not just a small company, but, but for a small company that's looking at being able to afford to enter a certain market, you can, you can shift from, from having a situation where a market, you can actually distribute viably in a market where you couldn't before. So that's the key that I see for, for TTIP. And I suppose the same argument could be used about standards and you know, different uh, ways of doing things, et cetera, et cetera. But let's turn to, to Sabina now. And if you don't answer the question, I will ask you again afterwards. But let's hear what your comments are to this. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Martin. 
Thanks, Kim. Um, actually, uh, a lot of uh, your comments, I think you could just skip the word you American and put European as a means because <laughs> but it's, it's the same. Um, it's a very, it's, we have the same practical problems. It's, it's not a nationality thing. Um, so uh, I could see a lot of, of our SMEs uh, in what you just, uh, just presented. But let me just briefly give um, a short explanation about UAPMED to also make a bit clear that our point of view, even on SME, it's very similar. Um, um, but we, we might have a different different approach. Um, I'm not talk, I'm not working for, for SME. I'm working for, for SME organization, and I'm not working for one national organization, but I'm working for the European umbrella organization. So this means that uh, our members are in total, we, ha we are in 34 countries within Europe, and we have 80 different member organizations. This means, of course, also that uh, experiences of import exporting in each country within the European Union or other European countries um, can be quite different compared to if we are, you know, if you look at the U.S. market where you have basically uh, this huge market and all of them apply more or less the same um, the same legal framework. Um, Having said that, I mean, we are still, um, UAPME is representing um, um, SME organizations, which in total represent 12 million SMEs, and we are responsible for the, or who employ 55 million people. So it, it, it's, 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 it's quite a lot of um, SMEs who, for us, try to voice their, their concerns. Um, when we're talking about internationalization for SMEs, um, because of the geographical situation in Europe, our, our situation is, is, is very different. Looking at the numbers, um, right now we're about one third of the SMEs are working internationally, internationally. But what does it mean? Like some of them only import, you know, like they never leave their member states, you know, they just stay in the home country and they import goods from within the European Union or even outside the European Union. Uh, some, you know, are more adventurous and they, they cross the border and, and go actually to another member state to export, to, to provide services, something like this. Having said that one third of the SMEs is working internationally with, within Europe, only half of them actually goes outside Europe. Many SMEs, if you look at the at the map of you, you know, like many German SMEs, they go to Austria. Austrian SME goes goes to Germany. So this is um, this is also considered internationalization of SMEs, but it's not the same like the US, you know, who is kind of going across the Atlantic to <laughs> to Europe or to any other um, continent, actually. So I think this is. I didn't get. To, I'm not sure, Kim, if you mentioned numbers. I think. In total, the numbers of SMEs in Europe who are working internationally should actually be much higher because of the we have a smaller geographical uh, location. Um, because, of course, this also includes um, includes neighboring countries. Looking at the statistics, of course, um, on how much do SMEs earn who work internationally, it's, it's very similar to the US. I don't have exact figures here, but also SMEs in Europe who are working um, internationally, they have higher benefits, they, uh, they employ usually more people. Um, so there's a lot of um, you know, positive benefits, benefits if you dare to, to go to, to another market. So I'm not sure what you mean, um, Martin, by US, uh, by European SMEs are more protective than US SMEs. What I mean is that you often uh, have seen also in the debate about the internal market in Europe, at least a number of SMEs thought it was nicer to keep, you know, protected, uh, protect the whole market rather than <laughs> being offensive and, and going out. And I could imagine the same, the same things would be uh, in the TTIP negotiations. But I'm basically asking what your feeling is, and yeah. I, I know you pr probably have a professional duty to say I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's for, for European SMEs, it's already quite a challenge to, you know, to work in the other European countries where you have so many languages to satisfy and, and so on. Um, but, um, yeah, not sure if that's more protective <laughs> than ours. Um, 
And I would actually, um, I, when I think I answered your question, so I would actually like to go a bit more into discussion of what what SMEs or SME organizations are expecting from, from TTIP and how it could be beneficial for them. The, the, the bottom line is that, that uh, WAPME, as, as, as most business organizations, uh, is of course supportive to, uh, to TTIP, but, but it also depends a lot on, on, on you know, what the outcome of the negotiations will be and uh, how much the SME um, perspective will be uh, considered, how much it will be reflected in the, in the, final, in the final outcome. So one, one of the points we always raise is transparency, for example. We do follow the, the negotiations. We see it's, it's uh, compared to other international treaties, there's a lot of improvement with regard to, to um, transparency. Um, there are like a lot of stakeholder events. There has been an advisory group just created by the commission. So all of the steps are really welcome by, uh, by us, by UAPME. However, when we look into the detail, you know, we look at the expert group, there are 14 experts so far. There's no SME representation um, in that expert group. So for us, that's a point of concern. Um, when we also look, um, we look at the negotiations. Um, I mean, uh, there's no agenda. The draft text is not publicly available. I know this is usually not the case for any other international agreement like this, but this makes it much more difficult for us to comment, to say, to say yes, sure, the, the SME perspective is included or not. This is, this, this, is, um, this is a problem for us. This is also when I look at, uh, when I talk to our national member organizations, it depends very much to which organization I'm talking to. I, mean, I especially mentioned Germany. Uh, where I'm from, when I look in the German newspaper, there's a lot, a lot of concern about TTIP, a uh, very strong opposition. And a lot of this opposition, I think, could be avoided if, if, it, if it would have more transparency, because a lot of his arguments, are, which are picked up, you know, like they are kind of picked up in a wrong way, when they are kind of, um, I don't know, abused, and then, you know, it's very easy to create uh, a fact, uh, create, create a, a case which is, easy for people to, to say, oh, we are opposing TTIP. I, I luckily, I don't see it in so many other uh, member states yet. Uh, I see it a little bit in Austria, other countries. I think Italy is a bit more relaxed, you know. Uh, France is also following, but more relaxed. But, but where I also, um, I, I also have, um, not yet, but I might have problems to speak with one voice as a European organization depending on, on the t development, uh, the political development, development in the different countries. To um, another demand from the is of course, also to include an SME chapter in, in, in the TTIP uh, negotiations, just to really make sure that the concerns of, of the SMEs are taken into account. And Kim, I mean, she did a really great job in, 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 in mentioning explaining how the situation is for an SME. They, are, um, they don't have the strong manpower, they don't have a legal department usually. Uh, the, the average SME, you know, many of them are between, uh, in Europe, between 10 and, 10 and 50 people, uh, employees. So it's, it's, and 50 is already quite a lot. So, so it's really, really um, important for them uh, to, to be able to comply with, with, with you know, with the standards, with, with the different rules, with the tariffs. So it's, 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 quite, it's quite challenging for them. And where, of course, where we see a lot of, um, a lot of um, benefit, potential benefits in the TTIP, you know, if tariffs are reduced or, you know, at least where it can be, uh, uh, you know, if the, the non-tariff bar barriers, you know, if, if they are, if they are tackled, sometimes we have, we have to see if, if there's possibility by mutual recognition, but also to see um, if we might have, um, you know, if we have similar um, level of protection, but in different ways, if there could be some, some streamlining, as, as, as Kim said. So this is certainly um, is also very much uh, supported from us. And I think on this point, it will be decided if TTP 
it will be beneficial for SMEs or not. Because, um, I mean, as also as Kim mentioned, the, the big companies, they will manage. They will certainly manage with difficult, with um, complicated, difficult rules, if it makes sense or not, but they, they will manage. They have the, the manpower. The SMEs are not for them. It will be the question, do we go abroad or not? For them, if it's too complicated, they will not, not go or they will um, go and, <laughs> and fail. So I think I gave enough. Okay, but um, let's take on the debate from there. I mean, uh, I'm not forcing you on the particular question. I, I think what is behind what I said is basically uh, there is a situation where you could say, I mean, as you were underlining all the time, the regulatory barriers disappear, the tariff barriers disappear. Oh, it's easy to conquer the world. But it's also easy for your competitors to enter into your, into your markets. I mean, that is the kind of, of, of thing uh, the SMEs will have to look at. Do they uh, consider an advantage to be more productive, as you were saying, more aggressive on the export markets, or would you rather try to keep your competitors out? I think it's about the inner strength and your attitude and so on and so forth. Just on the debate you mentioned, I mean, you mentioned some countries, I've heard from other countries. I don't think there is a, a really fundamental debate now. I think it will really start when we begin to put all these regulatory affairs on the table. Not so much for the SMEs, but more in general. When it comes to hormones, when it comes to GMOs, when it comes to data, when it comes to chemicals legislation, all these kind of things, then I think we'll have a, you'll see a quite lively debate also continuing in the German press. But Kim, did you have any response to this? Because otherwise I'd like to see if there's um, anybody who would like to chip in. I already see a finger over there. And I didn't wait for an answer, but you didn't look like. You, you will get the chance now. There's a microphone between your chairs, so we'll please introduce yourself. Yes. Yes, hello. My name is Felix Neugart of the Association of German Chambers of Industry and Commerce. And I have one comment and one question to the panelists. The comment uh, is regarding the position of German SME companies towards the TTIP, which you raised, Mr. Martens. We have a survey among 2,200 exporting companies in Germany, a very large number of companies, all international, and we asked them, what, how important is TTIP for you? And over 60% of these companies told us that TTIP is important or very important for them. So I think this is a rather um, convincing number among at least the international uh, active uh, SMEs in Germany regarding the value and the benefit of uh, TTIP. Um, Did you ask the non-exporters as well? No, this is exporting companies oh, okay. because, I mean, non-exporters, they will be, you know, they will judge this uh, as consumers. So this is a different perspective. But among those companies who are directly affected by trading with internationally, I think we have an overwhelming majority supporting uh, this issue. Second question we ask is what is important for you within these negotiations? And there, uh, over 80% told us it's the non-tariff barriers, it's the regulatory issues, it's the mutual recognition or the harmonization of standards and norms mm. and certification processes which are important. And second then comes the customs which uh, you mentioned, the custom duties, which are of course generally low with some peaks, uh, but because the trade volume is so large across the Atlantic, so there's some, also some cost uh, to save there. Now comes my question. Um, you mentioned, Mrs. Erkins, the uh, debate that we have in Germany currently, which is indeed, Mr. Martens, is very intensive. It has a very negative dynamic. And uh, we have actually to be very careful with this because there's also very, there are arguments made very much against TTIP. Huh? So I think what we need and what is important for us in Germany of those who support this uh, free trade negotiations and support TTIP, this means international oriented business, that we make very clear to the public where the benefits are. And this is not only, you know, um, some general numbers, 0.5% of uh, GDP growth in 20 years, or whatever, 180,000 180, jobs in 20 years, but we need very concrete examples of SME companies who will benefit from these negotiations. Very um, plastic, very day-to-day uh, -day examples of SME companies who will benefit from this regulatory cooperation. This is something which is not, not very easy to, 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 uh, to collect, 
Uh, but nonetheless, I think, especially in Germany, if we want to um, if we want to have a voice in this debate and we want to change this dynamics, we need this example because this will show people that it's not only the big corporations, it's not only the large multinationals that will benefit from this free trade agreement, but it's uh, companies next door, SME companies, which are close to everybody. So my question is to the panelists, do you have concrete examples of SME companies um, benefiting from this and how they will benefit, especially from this regulatory cooperation? Thank you. I think it was primarily directed to you, Sabine, so maybe you have some examples. And keep. Oh, well, I don't have um, concrete numbers or anything, and it's also um, it's also a bit difficult because it's very often it's not just the SME who is you know exporting directly to the US, but it's also the SME who is uh, you know delivering goods to the exporting SME who is also benefiting if, if the companies. Uh, but but it's true. It's a it's very difficult to get. To get concrete examples, I agree, and it's it's very important. I agree as well, um, but no, we have not. Uh, we don't have a campaign yet. Um, it will also depend a bit on the sector because um, some sectors will lose, some sectors uh, will win. So that's that's also we are still in the process of, of trying to evaluate uh, the situation, sectors sector wise. But I don't have any um, numbers yet. But I think it might be a good idea for Yapme to actually have a number of good case studies as we go yes, along no, here, because I'm sure funny. Kim has some. Well, I'm, I mean, I think if we look at the objectives of the T TTIP are really, you know, involved in making trading easier across as many sectors as possible. Now, the agreement has not been negotiated yet, so it's impossible to give, a, to give concrete examples of what exactly will happen. However, you, what you could, you could do is say, say for example, if you, have a, you know, if you have a product that's very, very price sensitive, you know, practically a commodity product, for example, and your duty rate goes from 7% down to zero, you know, presuming that that, that that at least gets negotiated, that's a very, very significant benefit to the consumers, most fundamentally, but also, of course, to the, to the person selling the product, right? Now, on the other hand, if you've got a product that's uh, currently facing two very different types of standards, one in the US and one in the EU, and through the agreement, the two regions are able to streamline the approach so that maybe they either mutually recognize each other's uh, uh, approaches or maybe they together adopt one approach moving forward. That's a huge benefit to you. And it's a huge benefit to the consumer as well. Again, it coming in at lower, lower costs to the consumer and lower costs to the producer. So I think if you look at it, from those two perspectives. And, and it could be the case that your product has the benefit of both, uh, an eliminated duty and a streamlined regulation, where you could have you know, double the benefit. So it, it's, I, I guess that's the way I'm looking at it, is just knowing, not knowing exactly which sectors are going to have which benefits, but looking at what's possible. Okay. I'm not sure we can answer the question because we don't know what the standards will be uh, yet. But I think there's a strong analogy. If uh, if you remember back on the um, the internal market in, in, in Europe, you know, I mean, it was more or less the same uh, discussion, at least because that was not a tariff issue, but at least about the, the standards. I know, for example, a small European business that does unique things, you know, that can regulate um, power produced by renewables. They sell a lot in the US and they sell a lot in Europe, but they have two different models. So I'm just waiting for the US to switch to 230 volt and your European plugs, you know, then everything will become much easier. <laughs> I'm going there next month, so I don't know if we can fix it before. Anyway, um, any other? Yes, lady. Need to push a little button there on the mic, I think. Good? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Jordan Valdez of the Office of International Trade at the U.S. Small Business Administration. 
Um, two questions for the panelists, uh, one dealing with uh, a comment that was made specifically by Kim. Uh, there's been no shortage of an attempt, I would say, by the U.S. government to get as many SMEs to give their input as possible into the potential free trade agreement and what the, the positive or negative impacts could be to them uh, so as to understand a little better, you know, what exactly it is that we are that we're fighting for. So I would ask both panelists, I think there was a reference made to, it's very difficult um, you know, to, to get that point across and, and I would agree and echo that. So really what can be done to get more, get more perspective from SMEs as these negotiations go forward um, in, your in, for, in your point of view? Um, the second question is, um, is it, in your perspective, is it possible or, or what will be the um, impact or outcome of, of the fact that both uh, both regions define an SME a bit differently or quite differently, um, either panelist. J just before you answer, can I just see, uh, will anybody else like to chip in? Any other questions here, just to have a feeling of the timing and so on? I see two more. Is it okay that we just take these two and then uh, try to answer them together? Let me go over there to the gentleman there, yeah? Mm. SMEs. For us, that is a key point. Also, uh, we haven't yet heard rules of origin, um, how the sourcing can comply, how we can make it easier. Um, isn't that something we should consider in this context as well? Thanks. And the final question was, uh, yes, please. Well, 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 uh, three questions here, uh, different, but also with a bit of overlap. Uh, Kim is very eager to jump in. Yes, go on. Uh, wow, okay. And the first question had to do with, with how to engage more SMEs on both sides. I, from, from what I can see, both governments have really done every, it seems to me almost everything that they can do by continuing to ask for input, and I'm not sure what else the government can do. I suppose we could do a much better job at the private sector chamber level, things like that. Chambers of Commerce perhaps could be could continue, I suppose, their efforts as well to to bolster that um, that aspect. With regard to the rules of origin. Yeah, that's a very, very important point, and the movement of people. With regard to the rules of origin, um, I think it's very, very important that those are that those that that our approach to determining what is a European product or what's a U.S. product it, um, absolutely is is um, mutually agreed upon. Let's say, and I think there's, if I re if I recall correctly, the general stance of the business community in the U.S. is to adopt the, um, the cumulative method where basically you, you look at, you know, if I think it's if over 50 percent of the product is made in that one particular region, then it becomes, a, you know, made in, that, made in that region, if I'm not mistaken. With regard to movement of people, this is very, very critical for us because um, almost any product anymore requires training of their sales forces. And I know that's been a major issue for us to get, um, to have the ability for salespeople in other countries to come to the US for training. It's been a real problem 
real problem. And it's created, our, our inability to do that easily has created a lot of costs. So yeah, it's a big, big deal. And strategy? I think, I think if you're a company that's small, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're a company that's um, unsophisticated. There are a lot of companies that are small on purpose and stay small because they can stay profitable that way and like to be under the radar, you know? Uh, don't necessarily want to be big. And, and the companies that I've seen that have had the staying power um, do indeed take their strategies very, very seriously in terms of how do they approach a market, how do they enter it. <clears throat> and the world is becoming more complex, so I think anymore you, it, it's incumbent upon any business owner to really think through their market entry strategies. I don't think it can be avoided, I guess, is the way I would answer that. Sabine? Um, well, to get more SME perspective, I think it's, it's uh, quite simple, and I think the commission is already doing um, is on the right path. Even though we still think there's room for improvement, the advisory group is good, but no SME representation, so that needs that should be changed. Uh, there, um, in, on investment, there's a consultation which is going to be launched uh, next couple of days, I assume. Uh, this is uh, also very important that um, because there yeah, everybody can um, can voice its concern. SMEs uh, also we will certainly uh, voice uh, you know give our opinions. So of course here in Europe we have a lot of public consultation. Even though that's so far I think only one is foreseen for TTIP. Of course it's a lengthy process, but it, it would be it, it's quite helpful. And of course contact the business organizations. You know, the, not, not just, I mean, of course, also on European level, but also the, the ones in the national level see, uh, you know, what, what is their perspective. Uh, so that, that would be quite easy to do if you want to have more SME input. Um, you said, uh, if I got that, somebody said, um, there's maybe a problem or a difference in SME definition. Well, I don't think it's so different. I mean, uh, the numbers, I think, in the U.S., the SME is, is I think, 500. And, I mean, in Europe, it's 250 maximum. I mean, it's, I mean, also, we have some European countries, like in Germany, where also the, the, the SME number is higher than, than the 250 on European level. Um, but it's still it's the same problem because the majority of the SMEs are usually not in the... Not in in, in, the, in at the higher end, but they are more in, in the average end of around. Uh, at least in Europe, about 50. I don't 50 employees. I don't know. In the, it's probably similar yeah. numbers. So um, same problems, I would say, more or less. <laughs> yeah, it's same. Um, there's not uh, not really a significant uh, defense. Rules of origin, of course. It's 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 very. Um, Everything um, related to intellectual property is an issue, especially if you have this um, highly uh, highly developed markets in the U.S. and in, in, in Europe. Um, the protection of intellectual property is, is needs to be very strong, and of course, it's, this needs to include uh, the recognition and effective protection by the U.S. of geographical indications. Also in the area of agriculture, this is where we have uh, different uh, point of views. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, we are still in the process of negotiation. <laughs> so what else do I have? <coughs> Strategy. Well, I mean, I think Kim already answered it. I mean, uh, it doesn't matter if you're a small or big company. You need to, if you enter, I mean, even your local market, you know, you have to have an idea, you know, you're not every, you know, we have so many businesses opening up and closing down because they don't have a good strategy. Of course, you have to see uh, where can I sell, um, where are my customers, is there a need for my product, do I need to adjust the product? So, so this, is, um, this is the same, no matter if, if you're small or big. I mean, to survive, you need to have a good business plan. Um, so we cannot, I don't think we can get rid of strategy for SMEs. Thank you, Sabine. And I think at that last point, I mean, I just want to repeat what I said before. You can be happy about the barriers for you on the internal market or the transatlantic market is reduced, but don't forget that your competitors get the same advantage. 
And I think this is then the question in the larger market. If you are exposed to the competition, how do you become unique? I mean, how do you position yourself in, in this new business environment? I think it's a, it's a fatal mistake to think that these things don't change the way you do business. And then we can probably have a discussion afterwards on how we define strategy. But I mean, this is basically what it's about. How do you, how do you face the, the new environment you're in? Uh, just one word about the free movement of, of uh, labor that was being talked about. I was sort of waiting for that to pop up. Extremely popular issue in, uh, in Europe already and in the US as well. I think a big, big issue here will be whether, because so many people still think about this in terms of the lump of labor theory. I mean, labor is a fixed mass. So any foreigner who comes takes a job away from a national. I mean, why can't we change this debate into a more dynamic labor market uh, thinking so that we can, uh, which basically illustrates we can all benefit from it. But let me also just, just say that, and maybe also to you to end this part of the discussion, I mean, we, can have, we need some good case stories. We need them from both sides. I think we should also be open about you know, bad news. I mean, the people who will fare less well, probably because they didn't do strategic thinking. But um, we shouldn't dismiss the, the overall advantages, because I think this is an argument as well, the growth and jobs potential in this. But I think this is also, there's a lot more at stake, at least for, for Europe, because I think this is also, I wouldn't say the last chance, but could be, you know, for Europe to actually play a big role in the international context. And at least, I could say, the, the role that the EU and US has, has played in the world is also at stake, I think, with this agreement here. Because there are other parts of the world that are beginning to pop up around. And I'm not saying we should be protectionist or anything like that. But if we want to, to, to have a dominance, this is also an argument. So with these uh, few words, uh, but I'll ask you to, to stay. We are actually perfect on time. Kim and Sabina, thank you very much uh, for this. Thank you also for the questions. And let's move now to the regulators, because I think we have been steaming up a few things here <coughs> that we would like to hear about. And um, Dennis, welcome to you. A little bit later, I introduced you at the beginning. So at this point, I think we have limited time. May I jump directly to you, Christina, and hear your views? Is this on? Yeah. Great, thanks. Uh, thank you to the European Policy Center, Hans Martens and uh, to the EU uh, TTIP SME lead from DG Trade, my counterpart, Daniela Donet. And I also want to acknowledge uh, Martin Pilzer from DG Trade and uh, Wojtek Sapinski <coughs> from uh, DG Enterprise, who are my colleagues at the US and EU have been really trying to lay a, a groundwork for a strong SME cooperation um, through the TTIP. And I think with the, the work we have with DG Trade and Enterprise on, ongoing, that that will be very strong. And then our ITAC 11 Industry Trade Advisory Committee member for small and minority business, uh, Kim Benson, has been a very valuable voice. And I've also had the chance to meet uh, Sabina already two years ago because of this, uh, these ongoing US-EU uh, SME workshops that the um, United States and EU have been convening. So it's nice to see Sabina again. Uh, in 2013, President Obama and his EU counterparts announced that the United States and European Union would begin negotiating a comprehensive transatlantic trade and investment partnership, TTIP. The United States and EU are already each other's largest economic partners, with two-way merchandise trade of $650 billion, uh, $1 trillion if you include services as well, and $3.8 trillion in foreign direct investment. Regarding today's topic of TTIP, what prospects for SMEs, as President Obama and President Hollande said on the occasion of the French President's visit to Washington, the trade and investment partnership that we are pursuing between the European Union and the United States is a major opportunity to build on millions of jobs on both sides of the Atlantic, already supported by US-EU trade. Such an agreement would result in more trade more jobs, which is really critical to both of our economies, and more export opportunities, including for small businesses in both of our countries. Our view is that the benefits of transatlantic trade are not just for the big companies and the hundreds of thousands of workers that they employ. Big companies that you've all heard of, like you know, LVMH, Louis Vuitton Moe Hennessy, Siemens, BMW, what's that, Bavarische Motorwerk, um, or Maersk, uh, employ many US and EU SMEs in their supply chains, and strengthening transatlantic trade will create more opportunities on both sides for SME firms and their workers. 
I'm really glad that the gentleman from the German Chamber of Commerce asked for examples, because I actually have a few. Um, Siemens, for example, is building parts for 70 high-tech Amtrak trains in Norwood, Ohio, Alpharetta, Georgia, and Richland, Mississippi, and assembling the trains at its Sacramento, California plant, thereby employing workers both in the United States and in the EU at Siemens. Additionally, the manufacturer is using, Siemens is using 69 suppliers in more than 60 U.S. cities and 23 states, many of whom are SMEs. One of these suppliers is Bentec, a Philadelphia-based manufacturer with approximately 80 employees. Bentec is providing Siemens with the grab bars located on the outside of the trains. And owner of this SME, Robert Benninghoff, says Siemens is one of the biggest customers we have. Additionally, National Fire Systems, Inc. is a small family-owned business in Sacramento with 12 employees and they'll be providing Siemens with portable fire extinguishers for each of the 70 trains in Amtrak's new high-tech fleet. SMEs like these are not household names, much less the many SMEs that sell directly across the Atlantic. As, as Kim mentioned, SMEs are much more likely to be direct sellers and exporters as well. For example, um, Kling Corporation has about 50 employees based in York, Pennsylvania, and makes refrigerated and power, con power generating container systems. Kling sources some of its inputs from Europe, so actually imports components from European countries, control system components, and then has exported the finished products to Germany, the UK, Denmark, Finland, France, Sweden, Norway, Italy, and Hungary. So for example, Kling has made total sales of over 7.5 million to the Sweden Defense Force. Or consider Perkins Products with just 24 employees in Watertown, Massachusetts, which makes assistive technology for the blind and visually impaired. Last year, the company sold approximately $800,000 worth of goods to EU countries. And the company believes that TTIP can help change the lives of their customers. Uh, TTIP not only makes good business sense, um, according, to, um, according to their CEO, but will also make visually impaired people more independent and employable in the countries to which we export and use their products. Or on the EU side, there are many, many um, examples. Um, one uh, that we're aware of is Universal Robots, a Danish company that exports and recently opened a sales office which employs five people on, in New York, in Long Island, with a view towards continued expansion in the US on the east and west coasts if the TTIP provides more opportunity for Universal Robots. So that's another example of how TTIP can also help innovative small uh, EU companies. Participating in international trade is one of the most effective ways for small and medium firms like these to increase their revenues, grow their customer base, and support jobs in their local communities. Our small businesses play a major role in international trade. And this may be a surprising statistic for you, accounting for 90, nearly 98% of all US exporters have 500 or fewer employees, and it's actually about Roughly two-thirds have 20 or fewer employees, like some of these company examples I just uh, gave. Um, nearly 300,000 companies, SMEs, export, exported about $440 billion, billion dollars in 2011. And for small U.S. companies, the EU represents a considerable market, with over 94,000 U.S. small businesses exporting there in 2011. In the US, research by our independent uh, US International Trade Commission shows that SMEs which export grow faster, add jobs faster, and pay higher wages than SMEs in the same industry that serve purely domestic markets. And overall, uh, direct exports by SMEs as well as those indirect exports in the supply chain um, to larger firms uh, that export support over four million jobs in the United States. So we are talking a lot about a lot of, uh, of jobs and revenue. ITC research also shows that SMEs benefit and may even disproportionately benefit relative to large firms from the cost-saving measures that can be enacted through agreements such as TTIP. And I think both Sabina and Kim have, have emphasized this point that with fewer human and financial resources, SMEs tend to bear the cost of trade barriers disproportionately. So small business is important generators of jobs, innovation, and economic growth in both the US and EU are a significant focus of our effort to open the transatlantic market. And here I'll quote uh, German Foreign Minister Steinmeier, who has said, our single biggest lever of opportunity is the TTIP. What TTIP will do is more than cutting tariffs. It will cut the red tape and special interests that stands in the way of innovation, 
Most of all, this will benefit the small and medium-sized companies. So TTIP can benefit small businesses in the ways, many of the ways that we've heard already today, reducing costs by eliminating tariffs at the border. In some cases, the removal of tariffs could allow SMEs to sell their products across the Atlantic for the first time, reducing time to deliver products to market through speedier customs procedures, reaffirming strong protection of IPR, which uh, Sabina mentioned, which is critical for innovative SMEs and helping to combat IPR infringement to which SMEs are particularly vulnerable, particularly if you are in an innovative industry and you have a small company, you cannot afford for a, a, a counterfeit or knockoff of your product in another market. Uh, increasing transparency and information for SME exporters and importers and laws and regulations affecting trade. Again, SMEs don't have huge teams of, of personnel and export compliance and government resources people to be researching all of this information, so we need to make it uh, more transparent and easier for them to find. And then reducing unnecessary costs and administrative delays and promoting enhanced regulatory compatibility, of course, while continuing to achieve the high levels of health, safety, and environmental protection that the U.S. and EU have. So together, we're also seeking to strengthen our ongoing cooperation on SMEs through the TTIP. Uh, as I mentioned, since 2011, the EU and U.S. have convened ongoing U.S.-EU SME workshops to bring together SME stakeholders, like the panelists here and, and many, hopefully in the audience, will also be attending um, on both sides of the Atlantic to exchange best practices, discuss trade issues of specific interest to small business, and identify ways to strengthen transatlantic cooperation on SMEs. Uh, as a result, we have a, uh, an MOU on uh, SME uh, cooperation, trade promotion cooperation between DG Enterprise and the Department of Commerce uh, International Trade Administration um, for, you know, seeking to cooperate on trade shows, for example, and B2B matchmaking in specific sectors of interest uh, to small businesses. Um, so far, such cooperation has occurred at, like, in medical devices and biotech at specific trade shows. Actually, one was in Germany and one was in Chicago. The most recent workshop was held in, in Brussels, actually, in October. And uh, the next one will be in the United States in 2014. And it's an ongoing forum for direct SME engagement with US and EU officials. And I know that EU's SME envoy, uh, Mr. Daniel Calleja Crespo, has been very involved in these workshops, as well as senior officials from the Small Business Administration who are here, and the US Trade Representative, DG Trade and Enterprise, and others. So we look forward to growing this up participation by SMEs on both sides of the Atlantic and hearing your voices uh, as we move forward uh, with the TTIP. So thank you for allowing me to present a U.S. perspective today. Well, thank you very much, Christina. I think in uh, trying to make the bottom line is good news for SMEs here. Yeah? There must be some bad news, but I'll think about that and maybe you can come up with some questions as well because there must be some threats as well. But let's hear from the European side, uh, Dennis. Welcome, sure. and over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much also for, uh, for inviting me. And, and it's, it's a pleasure to, uh, I think, to try to, to demonstrate in these short additional comments that I can make that I think we're, we're approaching this piece of the TTIP negotiation um, on the US and EU side uh, very much with a shared sense of purpose. I think this is one area where I think we have uh, certain views. They're very convergent. Uh, it's a question on building, as Christina has said, on, on a lot of activities that were pre-existing, and I think we want to use the TTIP to further uh, in different areas. Uh, we, I think we, we benefit uh, as a starting point uh, in our work, Christina and I, and the work of the colleagues that are involved from, uh, from a pretty clear mandate, first of all, for uh, uh, making sure that this is front and center of this negotiation, uh, not just out of the formal mandate that the high-level working group has given us, but also the informal mandate that our respective bosses are giving us, Mike Froman or Carol de Gucht, are basically telling us to get on with it in this area. Uh, and that is important. Um, second, I think it is important to, to recall, as Christina has said, that it, we're doing this uh, on the back of strong existing uh, cooperation between the, the two governments. Uh, and, and of course, not just DG Trade, but very much DG Enterprise uh, on our side, uh, where we've had uh, the opportunity to uh, benefit from the input from the SME community. That will continue, and that hopefully will be given uh, a, a new framework and a new status, in a sense, under this agreement, make it permanent 
and give it status. Um, we're also, point number three on this, in terms of where we're starting from, uh, we've decided very early on on the EU side to uh, consider pos positively uh, an, an innovation, which is something we're not doing in our existing trade agreements, which have an, a dedicated SME chapter as part of the agreement. And that is because of the importance of the issue as we see it in the transatlantic context, but it's also, in a sense, part of a of, of, of a consideration that goes beyond TTIP as far as we are concerned. It's about making sure that we focus increasingly on the, on the implementation side of our trade policy, what we do with the common commercial policy. Again, because we want to make sure that when we negotiate trade agreements, be it with the US or with other partners, uh, we have systems in place designed in the agreement that ensure that uh, governments on both sides, in our case us, are able to identify uh, shortcomings when the agreement does not produce the sort of effects that we think it should be producing to the benefits of uh, trading firms, uh, and that we have a mechanism to address any residual choke points as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And we're trying to do this much more, frankly speaking, than we have been doing in the past, where typically have a sort of culture where, you know, sort of part of the bureaucracy where I come from, where you negotiate trade agreements, then you forget about what you've negotiated, you move on to the next negotiation. Those days are over. We're trying to change our approach to this. And what we want to do in this area on the SME side is part of that broader uh, commitment. Now, obviously, we see, and I think we jointly see, the, the TTIP as something that can be beneficial to SMEs across the different silos of what is being negotiated at the moment. Uh, we've deep into round four this week across a range of negotiating groups. Uh, many of the issues will benefit uh, SMEs and larger firms symmetrically. I think there are also some issues where potentially they benefit asymmetrically more uh, SMEs. And that can be in a range of areas, both on the, on the, on the, the, the market access, the classical FTA side, and the non-classical regulatory side uh, alike. Uh, it is quite clear, I think you, you alluded to this, on the tariff side, where you have relatively low remaining tariffs, uh, even a relatively low tariff, residual tariff, tariff can make a difference when you're talking about certain sectors or certain types of transactions. Uh, where margins are low, and therefore the tariff side is not to be underestimated. I would add that it's also, we, we see this in a, in a sort of non-mercantilist way, it's both on the export side and on the import side. And you were, I think, giving some very interesting examples of, of SME case studies here. Uh, you know, we've been also engaging with our stakeholder community in the SME community uh, 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 recently. Uh, I've learned of the existence of a very interesting uh, uh, firm, which is actually located here in Belgium, uh, which is producing some, some, some very interesting uh, high-value equipment, uh, pumps that actually go into, uh, and, and pumps and cameras that go into the oil sector and that do a lot of business. The Belgian company does a lot of business in Texas. But they face all kinds of different issues in the transatlantic economy and want to fluidify, in a sense, their positioning in the transatlantic economy in different ways. Uh, because they have not an issue on the tariff side on the, on the export side, they have a, an issue on the tariff side on the import side for importing components, actually, from the US uh, here. And vis-a-vis uh, -vis the export side, they have different types of considerations. As I understand it, one of the issues that they have told us they face, and it's an interesting example, it's the whole issue of customs formalities when you ship demonstration equipment towards the United States, which is a radically different type of, of, of issue, of problem, addressed differently and elsewhere in the agreement. But we have to start looking at this in an integrated way. Now, that's for the tariff side. I think the regulatory side is also very important in many ways, not least because of the compliance cost. Uh, and the compliance cost, a priori, is asymmetrically detrimental to the SME community, uh, uh, simply because of, of, of resources uh, and means. I think also, final point on how, how we see the, the importance of the, the different substantive silos in the agreement, um, we, we obviously have a, a transatlantic relationship which is 
a big investment relationship, but it is still a very big trade relationship. And on the trade side, and I'm thinking about areas on which I also work on the negotiations on customs related issues, trade facilitation related issues, there's a lot there that hopefully we can do if we're ambitious enough in this agreement, which will probably benefit SMEs asymmetrically more than, than larger firms. So we're going to be looking at identifying those issues and as much as possible, of course, front-loading uh, the negotiations and the results in these different areas. Now, all this uh, should be then backed by uh, a, a, a specific uh, SME chapter in this negotiation, which we're, we're looking into uh, uh, together. I think it can have several components. I mean, apart from, as I said, uh, consolidating already some of the cooperation activities that we have in this area, it can do two other things, and again, I'm, we're at early days, and we'll be talking about the, the content of that uh, uh, together actually, on Thursday <laughs> in the negotiating group, and not in front of you necessarily. But uh, I think we can we can already say that, uh, that there's cer certain dimensions that we can see emerging in a, in, a, in a chapter of this kind. I mean, the first one is the, the whole information sharing side, which I think is very important because at the end of the day, the transparency part, I think you mentioned this, Christina, in our view is probably key. Uh, we have to make sure we provide uh, tailor-made access to SMEs through website websites where we reduce the information gap and the information asymmetry as much as possible. And we're going to have to work out to commit to do that in specifically prescribed ways in the agreement and try to do that, again, as ambitiously as possible to make sure we have the capacity to reduce the information gap as much as possible through the, this SME chapter. Uh, that can also go hand in hand, probably, with a, a, a sort of exchange mechanism between the EU and US governments that would help to make sure that these efforts that we make in terms of information sharing and information provisions are maintained over time, are kept up to date. Uh, and that's the sort of, uh, of, of tool that we, th we think, and I think it's a shared ambition, that we want to try to develop in the, in the agreement. The other element is, is to try to have also an institutional structure out of, out of the TTIP that would allow governments to talk about the actual concrete implementation of the agreements to the benefit of SMEs together, but also find ways to have both governments under the framework of the TTIP interacting with the SME stakeholder community as part of the architecture of the agreement. So I think these are the sorts of things that we see in terms of both the overall agreement and the way we can build um, uh, an element of structure through an SME chapter to support the potential gains that are there in the agreement. Maybe I could say just to finish a word on, on, on the discussion we had earlier where I understand and we feel that there are, there are doubts about uh, uh, the potential gains from the agreement, uh, uh, mounting criticisms about the negotiation, about the TIP, and it is true that there is out there a certain perception, at least in certain quarters uh, in Europe, but perhaps also in the US, I don't know, where there is a sense that this agreement uh, for some is uh, an exercise of lowering standards for the benefit of big business, done in an opaque way. If I sum it up, basically, that's where we have the different strands of criticisms coming together. Now, because of that, I think we are certainly on the, on the EU Commission side, uh, and I think, again, this is something we've been talking about together with, with uh, our American colleagues. We do accept that it, it is important for us as well, involved in the negotiations, to explain what it is that we want to do, which is exactly what we're doing now, to exemplify, to be able to illustrate what indeed we are meaning for concrete, real people, so not the 0.5% GDP growth type, but Mr. X, who's having a business, is doing certain things, and engage, engage with the stakeholder community so that as we work, we keep receiving input from the stakeholders uh, in order to make a potential SME chapter better, richer, deeper. So explain, exemplify, engage is what we're going to try to continue to do. Uh, one of the things we're discussing uh, together uh, is to uh, actually issue uh, documents to the public about 
well, how we see the SME dimension of this agreement. We're working on something like this together. We hope to, that this is the sort of uh, um, illustrative uh, uh, material that can actually start feeding into the debate so that we also project uh, positively what we want to do with the agreement as opposed to uh, having to counter the more neg negative perceptions that are that are appearing in the in the debate so this is what I want to say on in terms of where we are on, on our side at least thank you very much Dennis <coughs> and I can assure you that I'm not meeting anybody even my family without talking TTIP with them and uh, I'm doing that because I think the biggest risk is that there's a lot of people who doesn't know about it until the last minute because you're always afraid of the things you don't know about. So if there, anybody asks me to write an article or give an even interview, I will always, in a way, come into TTIP because I think, I think you, you should not underestimate the way from what we are talking about here today and out to the individual SMEs. It is really difficult to get, uh, to get the points of view out there and, and, and make them begin to think. But it's also ironic in a way, uh, because you mentioned the transparency and the new approaches and so on. Actually, <clears throat> this is the first time I've really seen an active approach uh, from the negotiators to be transparent. I know there are things that you will need to sit on, you know, for quite a while. But uh, I've, I, uh, so I acknowledge the, the increased transparency in the information flow. But then I also think that I've never seen anybody criticizing a process so much like this one for not being transparent. So there is apparently some, how can I say, differences in judgment out there. But, but the information is there and please keep it up because otherwise it will be impossible to carry it on to other people. Now, thank you again very much. Um, let me see who wants to ask some questions here or maybe discuss transparency, what could be done more and better. No one? Yes? I, uh, how many questions and comments this time? Can we ask for one question, perhaps, right? I choose one comment. Um, just uh, to make sure that um, um, an issue that has been raised in the first Q&A session is the rules of origin. And I just wanted to make sure that this is the importance of this topic for SME companies has been properly understood, because I think it's a key issue which will decide on the participation of especially small companies in a free trade agreement or not. Uh, I think uh, rules of origin act as a kind of gatekeeper which will allow SME companies to participate in the first place which will decide uh, if a product produced by SME companies will benefit from preferential tariffs and therefore fall under the uh, free trade agreement and as I understand um, the approach towards rule of origin is very different in the US, which is more text-based, and the EU, where it's more in, in tables and various product categories. So I think it's very important that we have an approach which defines rules of origin as easily as possible, as um, easily handleable for small companies who have not experts to deal with this, and of course that we avoid to have certification processes in many free trade agreements, we have special certifications for companies that want to um, um, participate in the preferential tariff system. So my, um, my, my uh, idea and my uh, um, 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 wish from you is, as regulators that you make sure that this topic is taken seriously and that we have um, in the end, as an outcome of the negotiations, rules of origin which are manageable and handleable by SME companies. Thank you. Are you doing that, Christina? I am not personally, I'm not responsible for that issue. Perhaps uh, Denis has some comment. But just in general, I mean, we've heard from SMEs across a range of sectors, including rules of origin, including tariffs, including technical barriers to trade and standards, I IPR, <coughs> customs issues. You know, we solicit comments from our public, across, and including SMEs across the range of these barriers. So we are familiar with some of the issues that you have identified regarding um, rules of origin you know, in, a, in our other free trade agreements as, as well as this one. So I know, you know our negotiators are, are taking into account uh, these comments to try to make the uh, agreement as, as user-friendly as possible. Oh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, as I said, it's, it's, it's about looking at 
all kinds of possible choke points, uh, which are addressed in all kinds of different uh, categories of, of disciplines. But you can create disciplines in an FTA which can be more or less SME friendly, depending on the exact detail of what you do. I, I, you know, this is not rules of origin, but this is a customs related issue. I take an example. If we're going to use the, the trade agreement, for example, to um, go further in terms of the, the mutual recognition of our respective trusted traders program. And the big question is, can that be done in a way which allows for uh, more small traders to actually be able to uh, raise themselves to the bar and get onto uh, AEO uh, uh, or CTPAT status? So it's all in the detail of what you do under the different silos, I think, that we're going to see the degree to which we can, we can uh, extend and produce uh, benefits specifically for the SME uh, communities in the design of the disciplines or of the, the cooperation that will flow from the, from the agreement. Rules of origin is one example, but there are many others, I think, across the, uh, the trading goods area. I'd just like to make one um, comment. I think you're absolutely right. This is a very, very critical issue. It, it, if it's not addressed properly, SMEs are not going to be engaging in the, taking the advantage of the agreement to begin with. So um, I, just, I would just like to say it's a perfect example of the kind of uh, challenging issues that the negotiators need to face. These are, you know, the U.S. has one approach for calculating uh, whether something is a U.S. or a European product, and the Europeans have a different approach. Uh, they have tables, as you said, versus we have, you know, percentages of, of components, let's say, on a cost of goods sold basis. So we have different approaches, both of which are, they're simply different. There's, there's, it's not that one is better or safer or superior. They're simply different. And this, these are the kinds of issues that they're coping with. So they're not trying to necessarily, not, they're not, not at all, they're not trying to lower standards in any way, shape, or form. What they're trying to do is come up with different approaches that will take into account all of the concerns on both sides. But it's not a matter of lowering standards. It's a matter of converging them where it's possible to converge them. But this is a perfect example of one of the one of the aspects that's so challenging. Yeah, thank you very much, Kim. Um, anybody else? Yes, the gentleman here. We have two. Let's take the two questions. Anybody else want to chip in? Because otherwise, we. Oh, now they're coming. So we have three questions here. Please go. Okay. Um, back on the same um, subject. Introduce yourself, Ken. Uh, Perry Cleese, Janopoulos from the firm Rep of Greece to the EU. Uh, the um, small and medium-sized enterprises are concerned as, and there is a fear out there that they won't uh, actually benefit too much from this yeah. agreement because they don't have the, uh, uh, the resources to benefit from the value chain theory. While big multinational corporations, you know, can move around the world and take advantage of that. So at the end, they're afraid that they'll be left out. Just to comment on that, please, whoever is. Okay. Uh, can I see the hands again? Yeah. You and then you. Miguel Narvaez from the Mission of Mexico to the EU. Uh, I just want a quick, uh, quick question. Uh, because the SMEs in both sides are protected, as, as Mr. Merton says, uh, what happened with the farm bill, the PAC, the fishery, uh, the fishery policy, and all these kind of issues also in public procurement, also in services, that both sides trying to protect more the, the SMEs in both sides? Are, are the negotiation in the TTIP making an, a systematic approach in, to the SMEs in all these kind of issues in, in the agricultural, in public procurement, in services, or just one chapter that we want to be collaborate between SMEs, and that's it. That's, that's the question. Thank you for the question, and you, yeah. Um, Gerai Serbest, Transparency International, EU office. Um, you told us about your concerns over transparency, and I was wondering if uh, you have concrete examples of business 
inputs for uh, getting transparency in the TTIB? And if not, uh, would you have next steps to engage? Okay, again, three different questions. Uh, may I add to, to your question as well? Uh, because I was planning to do that at the end. Uh, basically, ask the, the two uh, negotiators to, to, to tell us what it is you want to achieve, because obviously you can write a chapter that we need to be nice to SMEs and all that kind of stuff. But uh, they are, of course, much more dependent on what happens in the area of food regulation, in the area of data regulation, in the very technical areas. How do you bring all of this together? Am I sort of, yeah, okay, we are more or less on the same line. I think you felt a bit cheated out there. You have a, a 10 second question, okay? Yes. Thank you. No, Mike. And then we take the final round and then you can get off. We're beginning to run short for time, so I meant the 10 seconds, right? Um, Lars Nordgaard, Norwegian Mission. Uh, just a short question. Uh, we haven't discussed or you haven't addressed the issue of access to internet. I mean, the whole thing of using the internet as a means of selling and buying and procuring services and goods across the Atlantic. That must be a very important aspect of TTIP for small, medium-sized businesses. Or am I wrong? Thank you. I think you're right, because there is a question here also of the jurisdiction in regard to cloud services and stuff like that. May I, by the way, congratulate uh, the speaker from Mexico and Norway for not mentioning what about third countries, but uh, we didn't bring that up at all. So, Christina? Oh, thank you. Um, I, I think it's our, our shared belief here uh, between the US and the, and the EU um, that, that SMEs stand to benefit strongly from um, a comprehensive and ambitious TTIP covering all areas and sectors, and that, as Denny pointed out, may even disproportionately benefit from the reduced costs that we expect that the TTIP will generate and the increased jobs, job, job growth. SMEs, I think, in both the U.S. and the EU employ the majority of workers. I think it's slightly higher in the EU, but it's half of our um, non-farm private sector in the U.S. and about SMEs employ about 40% of the, of the high-tech workers, scientists, uh, engineers, um, technical professionals. So we certainly hope that, um, that the TTIP is going to strongly benefit the, uh, the SMEs in all of those sectors, as well as in, as, as well as in agriculture. In the U.S., it's actually you know, most of the producers who actually grow the food are, are small producers that then provide the products for export to larger companies and um, cooperatives. So in, in manufacturing, where um, very high concentrations, for example, of, uh, of our industry concentration in, in electronic products, in um, transportation equipment, in chemicals, for example, medical devices have, um, you know, 80%, 90% SMEs in, um, in some cases, and then as well as in uh, industries like professional, um, uh, in services industries like engineering, architecture, um, scientific consulting, a, a lot of these uh, ICT have uh, high concentrations of SMEs, which, uh, which gets into the second question about, you know, we expect that, um, you know, a comprehensive and ambitious TTIP will provide um, market access and new two-way trade opportunities uh, for s firms and uh, producers of all sizes, both small um, and large, but that we think that in um, the areas of the agreement where you know we have other negotiators that are responsible for tariffs, that are responsible for IPR, that are responsible for rules of origin, et cetera, we want to make sure that we, um, those of us responsible for SMEs, uh, include the, the input of small businesses into the, 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 the provisions of these negotiations. So um, this gets into the gentleman's transparency question and how we receive the input in the U.S., our, our domestic process. We feel we have a very ro robust domestic process for ensuring that SME views are uh, included um, as inputs into the negotiations. So, for example, our Federal Register notice um, seeking a U.S. government public comment on what should be the negotiation objectives for the TTIP 
you know, is, is uh, widely disseminated across the country. And we also try to leverage agencies like the U.S. Small Business Administration, which actually feed deeply into the networks of small businesses around the U.S. for, um, for federal register notice and comment. We've also held a series of SME roundtables with uh, SBA and commerce assistance around our country and in, uh, in 28 cities and uh, public hearings as well um, that are focused specifically on, um, on uh, SME input. We also have our cleared advisory committee system, which includes SMEs throughout, not just in the industry trade advisory committee for small and minority business, which Kim sits on, but we have uh, SMEs in, in, many of our, um, in many of our committees as well. And so um, through all of these mechanisms, we, we are expect, you know, we, we have a strong voice um, for SMEs in providing this input uh, directly to uh, negotiators in, in, in all of the areas of the agreement. And then on the last point on uh, access to internet, clearly um, the internet is, is you know, an empowering actually millions of US and EU SMEs um, and opening up the possibilities of online commerce in a way that wasn't there five years ago. I think internet usage in the last five years or, or access to the internet around the world, you know, not just transatlantically because we're mature economies, but globally as well, has gone from like 1.5 billion to 3 billion. And over the last five years, internet usage has quintupled. So a lot of these are um, potential Customers, you know, uh, online access. Actually, there have been an increasing number of studies about this from private sector groups like eBay and and public insti um, think tanks like the Brookings Institution that online SMEs are much more likely to trade and export to multiple markets than their offline counterparts. So we see that there's a great opportunity for electronic commerce, for example, a TTIP provisions that would promote duty-free treatment of digital products and consumer access to services and applications of their choice on the internet, social media, et cetera. Um, new apps are developed by you know, innovative US and, and EU SMEs uh, that internet commerce um, actually reduces uh, a lot of these costs of, of reaching new customers. And so we are also exploring those opportunities. Thanks. And if you didn't think you got a good answer to the question about the SMEs, I can tell you that tonight, Christina is flying directly to Greece. She will now go and explain it directly to the SMEs down there, okay? Um, <laughs> Denis. Um, just maybe, uh, not necessarily to, 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 to cover the same ground, but just a couple of additional points. Uh, but on this question by, by Pericles, um, I think this whole question of uh, you know, who benefits from insertion into the supply chain. I mean, of course, for SMEs, the question is, it's a two-stage question, is are SMEs, European SMEs, integrated into the regional or, in some cases, the global supply chains? Uh, uh, yes or no, and then based on that, in the transatlantic economy, can we find ways across the agreement to uh, smoothen or fluidify the supply chain? Uh, in terms of being part of the supply chain, I mean, what is interesting in looking at some numbers is that you see that they very much are, because uh, one thing which is interesting to look at is the, is, is the, the, the data on trade flows, and to look at exports to the U.S. in uh, gross terms or in value-added terms. Uh, actually, we many European member states <laughs> export much more to the U.S., export much more national value added to the U.S. than actually think they do, precisely because they export a lot of value added uh, from their economy into the U.S., but indirectly, in some cases, very often through uh, uh, German manufacturing exports because there are uh, components, uh, 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 partners, and manufacturers <coughs> of those exports. So I think the importance of the transatlantic economy for SMEs um, in Europe, in some member states, perhaps is actually already underestimated by the way we measure trade flows. Now, building on this, and the question is, Will you then take a further step, again, through the range of issues that you have in the negotiation, which is going to help to, uh, through disciplines that apply to governments, the parties, that will help uh, to ensure that uh, the, 
the supply chain is not confronted with uh, choke points at various points, uh, either on the border side or on the, 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 the behind the border side. And that's, in a sense, what I would answer to your, your question, which is what are we trying to, to, to achieve? Well, it's, in a sense, it's quite simple. We're trying to achieve, I think, across the agreement, a, a, a significant cost reduction for in this particular case, mostly traders on the SME side. We're trying to achieve that and to make sure this happens both at, at entry into force of the agreement, but also over a longer period of time uh, through either a reduction or elimination of the costs of trade at the border, which remain significant in some sectors and for some operators, or through the reduction or elimination of unnecessary or unintended regulatory divergences that we have, which increase the cost of trade, and in this case of investment, behind the border. I mean, that is effectively what this is about. Now, question will then be, do we, we have the means, we will also give ourselves in this agreement the means to measure whether these cost reductions, uh, both uh, when the agreement is starting to be implemented and again over a much longer period of time, because all regulatory sides, of course, something that is, is plays itself out over time, will these cost reductions slash benefits accrue uh, properly and proportionally to the SME uh, community on both sides? And we should try to have mechanisms in place to ensure that that is the case and that we can actually monitor effectively that that is the case. I think this is how I would sum up what, we, what we're actually trying to achieve. Thank you very much for that, Denis. And I think this is not just your responsibility. It's also up to the SME uh, community itself to, to take the opportunities, I think, that uh, you were stressing. Now, I don't think you can discuss TTIP too much because I think uh, it is really groundbreaking and very, very important. And there are many levels we can discuss it on. I see this as one of the building blocks, and I hope uh, there will be more of these discussions as we go along. I think it was a good idea to focus on the smaller businesses uh, because we hear a lot of the voices of, of the big ones. I think there's been a lot of uh, food for thought on the table here today. So um, I would like to thank uh, again Kim for your long trip from California, Sabina from your long trip from Jacques de Lalan. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> thank you to you as well. But also a big thanks to uh, Christina Sevilla and uh, Denise Redonnet for taking the time out. I know you're busy, or rather you should be busy because you should be negotiating a good deal. Uh, but you took the time out. Uh, you provide a lot of valuable information here. So thank you very much for doing that. And um, I would like to thank you also for your participation. I wish you all a good evening, and I wish you a good trip to Greece. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.